We're at the Walker Art Center for a Regis Dialogue with filmmaker Alexander Payne. We're going to be discussing his artistic vision, his sense of humor, and his love of film. Alexander Payne's films, characterized by his ability to bring emotional reality to drop-dead funny character comedies, manage to be achingly true to life while dealing with seriously out-of-control situations. Even the setting of most of them, Payne's quintessentially all-American hometown of Omaha, Nebraska, emphasizes the notion that these people could well be anyone's friends and neighbors, maybe even yours. I'm Kenneth Turan, film critic for the Los Angeles Times and National Public Radio. I'll be your host as we discuss Payne's work. Now the Regis Dialogue with Alexander Payne is about to begin. Well, I wanted to start at the beginning. I wanted to start with Omaha. You are famously born in Omaha. I, I had kind of a two-part question about that. I wondered, first of all, do you think people make too much of that? There's always every article that is written that says, you know, Omaha, films in Omaha. Do people make too much of it? And on the flip side, what do you get from it? What do you think being born there, coming from there, has kind of done to the it's way so you look at the world? It's so funny because you're commenting on the question and making too much of it yeah. at the same time. It's not easy to do. Practice it. Like, <laughs> you can't have it both yeah, ways. Yeah. Okay, I, I think, I, I mean, for my taste, I think people do, t I mean, I get so sick yeah, of the question yeah, yeah. that was, you know, the B side of uh, why do you want to shoot there? Because I always say you never ask Spike Lee, Martin Scorsese, and Woody Allen that question about New York. It's yeah. just they happen to be from there. Quentin Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson happen to be from L.A., and you don't ask th them those yeah. questions. Why L.A.? Why would it occur to you to shoot in L.A.? Yeah. But because I'm from Omaha, you know, and I like to point out that Fellini shot early on in Rimini and even returned later yeah. for Amarcord. And, you know, I just think uh, in many arts, uh, earlier in your, in your career, you feel a necessity somehow to uh, connect to that. And I don't really know how to answer that question yeah. um, other than it occurred to me to do so. I'm tired of seeing, I was and remain tired of seeing American films really only set in LA, which I feel is an anomalous place within this country. Yeah, yeah. And yet it's shown to the world as being like typical of Quite the US. Central America. Beca it's only because the film business is located yeah. there and they're lazy and they don't go shoot in other places. <laughs> and I just was, and I'm, you know, the thing is too, it's like I think we're all, it's kind of my tirade, but we're all so anxious to see a version of ourselves mirrored in art and in cinema that I was never, I didn't grow up seeing myself a Midwesterner in yeah. film. I mean, you grow up in Omaha and you just see all those people out in LA and I don't, yeah. you know. No, but I mean, I still think, you know, even though it is trying to have it both ways, I mean, where we come from has an impact on who we are. And I do, you know, Agreed. I would, you yes. know what did coming from Omaha have to do with who you are today as a director? Well. The real answer to that would, I think, be more how did where I come from have to do with me as a person? And we could get into that, but I don't know, we got other stuff to cover. But I'm glad I'm from there for a variety of reasons. I think it's a great place to grow up and, you know, good values and a good rhythm of life and, and a certain honesty and frankness and humor with which I grew up. And I think Omaha is of the Midwest in that way, but also specific yeah, in yeah. its own way. Um, but uh, the other thing, too, just in terms of me personally as a filmmaker, is because I like to get reality in film, like somehow have a, you could even say, a documentary approach to fiction filmmaking, Yeah, yeah. that I felt I needed to get it right first in Omaha, the place I knew the best, yeah, before yeah. I could move on. And, and I think if Sideways is successful at all in terms of getting a sense of Santa Barbara County, it's because I went you, armed with what tools I had learned. Yeah and finally starting to yeah. get it right in about Schmidt with respect to Omaha. Yeah. Now, I read, and again, I, sometimes you read things. Uh, I know as someone who writes things, or things that you write and you read are not always true, but that you started with a ca you, were, you had a camera when you were quite young, that your family had gotten a kind of a eight millimeter camera. Is this a true my story? My dad, sort of. My dad <laughs> got, my dad owned a restaurant in downtown Omaha, which his grandfather had started. And uh, from Kraft Cheese, he had, uh, received a, not even Super 8, but regular 8 movie projector. Wow. 
which by, and in those days you get, I'm sure many of you remember, you used to buy like three and 12 minute versions of films in regular eight and super eight at the camera store. Yeah, yeah. Castle films and Blackhawk films later. So I took to that. And so when I, about five or six, started developing a, an, an interest in movies, my first thing was threading that projector and showing movies. And, and then later when I was about 14, I got a super eight camera. Yeah. But you know, despite this, Used. I mean, I, I was, you, <laughs> do you still have it? I do. All right. Uh, you know, I was interested that, you know, we so hear about filmmakers who's interested young and then they immediately go off to film school. I mean, I was interested in the fact that you did not, you know, you, I've just wondered, did you think about being a filmmaker at that age? Did you dismiss it? You know, you almost went to graduate school in journalism, undergraduate, you went to Stanford and had a classic liberal arts education. I just wondered what was your, your thinking about being a filmmaker at that stage. It was a far off dream. It was dream like, oh, wouldn't that be great? But it was so distant. And you know, you grew up in the Midwest with, uh, I'm second gem generation immigrant and it's not the mentality yeah, to think yeah. that that's possible. I mean, I, I'm so jealous of meeting people in the coast. It's like, oh, unless my parents were in the arts. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I grew up in the business, so no, it's like it's like it's a no-brainer. Yeah. But for me, it was so far away, and so in a way, I was headed toward it my whole life because I was such a film buff my whole life. And on the other hand, it took me to go through college, then actually get to like fall quarter senior year to think, well, where the hell am I going to apply to grad school? Yeah. And resisting my parents' pressure to apply to law school, I ended yeah. up taking the LSAT, but you know. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> but then my two, and I'd been taking, I was a double major in history and literature with an eye toward either journalism or film. I still had it in the back of my mind. I thought, well, you know, I got to apply. And unsure whether I had the talent or the interest, yeah. an interest that would extend to making films as opposed to just being a film buff. Yeah, yeah. And then I got in and then thought, well, I have to try this. Maybe yeah. I'll suck at it, but I've got to try it. Yeah, yeah. And UCLA is a very particular kind of place, and I, you know, I, I know other UCLA graduates, film school graduates. Can you talk a little bit about the sensibility <clears throat> of the place? I think in today's film schools, well, this was the mid '80s for me yeah. when, when USC was like the hotshot white guy film school to go to. Yeah, yeah. And I got into USC as well, and went down and spent two days at each place. Went down from Stanford to LA, and. Um, Really what tipped the scales was that USC is, a, is much more, USC and AFI are much more industry feeder schools, very Hollywood oriented. Yeah. And then you're paying through the nose for tuition yeah. and they retain rights to your negatives of, is your, that right? of really? your student films and you have to wow. compete to make advanced films. Whereas at UCLA it's a public school and it's one person, one film. You're expected to make yeah. uh, a film and you re it can be anything you want. and. And I, I think the best film schools in U, the U.S. continue to be UCLA and NYU, because NYU is similar. Yeah. And they also, I mean, it's kind of more of a, I mean, the filmmakers who come out of there tend to be more adventurous. They tend to be less the kind of cookie cutter filmmakers. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, <clears throat> I wonder what films you liked then when you were in film school. Who were the directors you admired and who you admired also when you were younger? You know, you started as, a, as an interest in film, you know, pretty young. In film school, in my 20s, I was, um, it was Kurosawa. Really? Yeah. And I, I have to say that the film that really tipped the scales toward my saying I have to go to film school is when I saw uh, The Seven Samurai, wow. when it was re-released in 82, and I saw it at the Castro Theater. Wow. And I'd never seen it, and I thought, yeah. you know, I'll never make a film that good, but what nice footsteps to try to follow yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. it's just, it was so cool and made such a, and it's still basically my favorite film. Yeah. Uh, and then I spent most of my 20s uh, reading everything I could about Kurosawa. And I got, I got deeply into Japanese cinema. Ah. Like as a kid growing up, it was a lot of uh, basically silent comedy and Warner Brothers pictures, yeah, you know, yeah. the gangster pictures and Jimmy you know, universal horror yeah. and, and uh, yeah. I was never too much into MGN movies, but it was mostly Warner, <laughs> Warner, Bro Warner Brothers and Universal yeah. and silent comedy. Yeah. And especially going back to the projector story, the only films you could get were basically silent films. Yeah, because they were in the public domain. I, yeah. Yes. 
And in fact, David Shepard, whom I yes, met later, yes. was running Blackhawk Black Black films. Yeah. And I used to use my allowance and send off to Blackhawk film. That is, I, I like that. You know, yeah. I just like that, that connection to the past. I know you, you've expressed, I wonder if you talk a little bit about the films of the 70s. That's a kind of a crucial period in American filmmaking that a lot of directors today look back on with, with, with real kind of admiration. Well, it's, been, it's, it's had a real impact on me, I think, only because even though I was watching, even in, in, my, in growing up and in my teens, fairly obsessed with older movies, still the new movies were 70s movies. Yeah, I mean, I'm born yeah. in 1961. Yeah. So, and graduated from high school in 79. And so all the movies, and my buddies and I were all great movie watchers. Yeah. And uh, so somehow 70s, that golden, you, know, you, didn't, you never know it's a golden period when you're living, when you're in, living it. in it. Yeah. But that period formed my idea, I think, of what an adult, a commercial adult American film is, and it's just never changed. Yeah, yeah. Really, in a way, your tastes lock in in your late teens. You yeah, know, you're tasting yeah. music and you're tasting film. Well, you know, I mean, I wanted, this is something I was going to ask you later, but I want to follow up on it. Now, why don't we have more films like that now? What is going on? You're a on? critic, you tell me. I well, mean, you, you, you think about those things. I do think I about do. those things. I, well, the whole way of business has changed. You know, the whole industry has changed in terms of what they're doing. I mean, the, the common answers, which yeah. you could explain better than I, are the, the home run mentality yeah. with Jaws yeah. and Star Wars and all that. And, you know, I don't know. On the other hand, a deeper answer is that any time in the arts or even in politics or in culture, things happen in, in, in bursts, often in 10-year spurts, that, that stem somehow from a historical necessity to have it. Yeah. You know, and certainly 70s filmmaking, you can in a way trace back to Italian neorealism, yeah. Yeah. And which came from a very specific historical necessity, both to, for culture to express itself and redefine itself, and a necessity for cinema, you know, a yeah. hunger for cinema, and then how that bled into French New Wave and auteur theory and how that then affected American filmmakers who were dealing with such heavy, can I say shit here? With such he heavy <laughs> shit in the 70s yeah, with the war yeah. and all that, you know, with, and, and somehow that we needed a cinema which was very close to society, to you know, a yeah. mirror. That's an interesting thought, yeah, and that, you know, maybe when we need it again, it's like Zapata. Well, I'm hoping that now with all the heavy stuff going on, although that, somehow we haven't really realized how heavy yeah. everything is, like as a society, we haven't, we're not getting it, we're, we're hearing it, but it bounces with, off yeah. us somehow. But my hope is that now we need it again in a new way, and yeah. I'm hoping my optimism, I mean, it's a horrible time in general for the world and certainly for this country, but I'm hoping that that will translate into a good time for the cinema. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. You know, the 70s that we have, oh, the wonderful time for cinema. Let's not forget Nixon was reelected by the biggest yeah. landslide ever. <laughs> you know. I know, I know. Now, 1990 was your, your student film, <clears throat> Passion of Martin. It was, for a student film, I, you know, I've read, a huge success. What did that mean for you? I mean, you've been a student at UCLA. You've been working kind of on your own. This film is shown, and what happens? Did you see that movie, The Big Picture, Christopher Guest's I first film? It, yeah, it was like yeah, that. Yeah. And it's what you hope, ha I mean, it's also a good thing of going to a film school. You don't need to go to film school anymore, but if, if one does, to show your work within a context that can help you get more work yeah, is yeah. a benefit. <clears throat> and I lucked into it. I made a 50-minute, which is showing tomorrow, a 50-minute thesis film, loosely based on an Argentine novel, a very famous Argentine novel. Huh. And it hit somehow. Again, in a way I never could have predicted. And, um, you know, it was one of those dream scenarios for a film student in terms of within a month I had an agent and a studio deal. Yeah, yeah. You know. But, you know, that can be, you know, I interviewed Todd Solondz once, and he said it was, you know, it, people were literally agents. He also had a hit student uh -huh. film. And he said agents would literally went down on their knees in front of him, you know, and it was begging that he sign right. with them. And it was very disorienting, and ultimately it drove him out of the business. I mean, did you find it disorienting? Was it, were there troubling aspects of it, or did it all seem like it was great? The most disorienting experience I've had has been the success of Sideways. Really? Actually, far more disorienting, because at that level, so much has come at me in the last few months, and kind of it's, it's a whole new level of having to deal with with stuff coming at me. And, you mean as a result of sideways? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Wow. much, a whole, whole level. 
The more challenging thing with the thing about that filmmakers have to know and that I've learned the hard way and continue to have to learn it is, you know, filmmakers always concerned about the next film. Yeah, yeah. You know, not just the idea for it, the script, and then can I come up with anything, but the opportunity to make it, obviously, and getting the financing. Yeah. So there's genuinely a skill about when you, when you finish a film and it has some notoriety, there's a window. There's yeah, a window yeah. of opportunity where stuff comes at you and people are like interested in you, and then they move on to the next thing. Yeah, and yeah. knowing how to capitalize on that window is something that I continue to witness and which I haven't known how to do until kind of more recently. Yeah. But I didn't and, realize... And, and just to yeah. follow up on the film school thing, I was... It, everything seemed assured that within a year I would be directing my first feature, yeah. yet it was five years. Yeah. Why did it take that long? Because I didn't know what to do. And the other thing too, not to get in too much into the film school thing, but when you're in film school, they always say when you show your thesis film, make sure you have your feature script ready. Yeah, yeah. But no one ever does. <laughs> no one ever does because you're working so hard editing and mixing and yeah. then you're exhausted and then it's time to screen your film and often you're basically running a wet print up yeah. to the screening yeah. room. <sighs> Yeah. Now you, you know, it's and actually, time. when I got out of film school, the, I told you I got a st studio deal. I wrote a script, the first draft of what only 12 years later became about Schmidt. Right, right. I want to talk that about that. About Schmidt yeah. was supposed to be my first feature, first not my one. third. Yeah. And you... Oh. <laughs> some fans? Glad some it fans. wasn't made first, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I mean, you went to the Universal, so what was your experience? You know, this is uh, your studio experience. Was it what? It's the velvet coffin. Really? Studio deals are the velvet coffin. It, it feels good. You get, I, I made enough money in one year to last me for five years because yeah. I, wow. never, I never changed my, no, it was, I made $125,000 in one year, of which you keep about half, which was 60,000, which lasted me five years. Wow. <laughs> Because <laughs> I never changed my living yeah, situation from that of yeah. a graduate student yeah. until basically after election. Wow. I never paid more than $800 a month rent until the year 2000. Wow. Basically. Save your money. Well, you didn't have it. You didn't have it. That's right. You didn't have so it. After yeah. Citizen Ruth, I had to borrow for money from my dad to pay my taxes. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, but how was the studio deal? It's great, but my advice always to younger filmmakers and film students is never take studio deals. If you want to direct. If yeah. you just want to write and it's fine, but if you're going to like pitch an idea and be paid for it, because then they own it. And yeah. they can sit on it. Yeah. And they can sit or make, make you go through really hideous casting hurdles. Yeah. The moment someone else owns your creative work, it, it's not good. Yeah, it's a devil's bargain. You get the yeah. money, but they... They so Sideways was something, and we can jump to this yeah. later, but Sideways was something which no studio had any part of until the very, very possible last moment. And that's yeah. basically the reason why it was made in the, in the, in the way it was with yeah. no movie stars yeah. and yeah. like that. It's better. It's better. One of the things I thought about, and you, know, you can see in The Passion mm -hmm. of Martin, is that you kind of see, and you see it in all your films, you know, and I wanted you to talk about it a little bit, that you kind of, at least for me, you kind of see comedy where not everybody would be seeing comedy. You know, I think there's a quote, I, you know, again, I hope these quotes are accurate, where you said, I like satire and comedy based in painful experience. You know, they are, yeah. I mean, is it, the, are, are you bored with talking about that? Or? I'm no, I mean these quotes. It's, yeah. it's fine. You yeah. sort of said them and you didn't really say yeah, them? Yeah, or it was years ago, yeah. or you say because it's convenient yeah. or something. <laughs> See, now journalists in the audience notice that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's just, I mean, I just like the fact, like I say, seeing all your films at once made me really see that these are kind of, people are going through difficult times in these films, but we're laughing. You know, and that seems to be kind of a dynamic. Well, isn't that life? You. Isn't that life, if you have a sense of yeah, humor? I mean, yeah. Jim, I have, and at this point, I have to include Jim Taylor because he's a yeah. central, he's my co-writer. I'm about to get there. Okay, <laughs> but the films, what you're talking yeah. about is very much an expression of how Jim and I are as friends together and then how we write together. And it's, it's, it really dates back to just how we hang out and say, oh, did you see, read this article or look at that guy over there and, oh, I had this really painful experience yesterday and, yeah. you know, talking about the pathetic side of our own lives, yeah. but we have 
at least what we enjoy is senses yeah. of humor. Yeah, you yeah. know, and <laughs> so it's very much the films are an extension in a way of how we occur together. Yeah, I wanted to show. I think we have a clip right now. I wanted to show, just a scene that I picked from uh, from about Schmidt that I really think is a it's a pretty sizable clip. It's about seven minutes, but it's a wow. scene that I really. Uh, it almost, to me, works like a short film. It's almost like you could pull this out and show this anywhere as just a short film in and of itself. Okay. Ahoy there. Ahoy! <laughs> Get yourself up here. <laughs> I'm Vicki Rusk. Warren Schmidt. John was so excited to meet you. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, you shouldn't have. It smells delish. Oh, I hope you like beef stew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, there he is. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Can I take your jacket? Oh, sure. Yep. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Something burning? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. I just lit a couple of matches is all. Oh. Shall we adjourn to the living room while Vicky... You're almost done, aren't you? Oh, just about. John, Warren brought us beer. Oh, thank you, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Here, have a seat. <laughs> right there. You take that one. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what do you do back in Eau Claire? Well, my brother and I, we have a little shoe store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a famous footwear, and. Uh, well, people will always need shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Vicki here, she's an occupational therapist. Oh. So that's our day job, you might say. How about yourself? Oh, I, I was in the insurance game, but uh, I'm retired now. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, boys, dinner is served. I've only known you for an hour or so. And yet, I feel like you understand me better than my wife, Helen, ever did. Even after 42 years of marriage. 42 years. Maybe if I'd met someone like you earlier, Oh, you sad man. You sad, sad man. You sad man. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great scene from any number of viewpoints, but I wanted to talk about the writing, uh, partly because I remember when I saw it the first time and I knew this was going to Cannes, I wondered, I mean, the, the writing is so specific. It's like this little kind of thing makes it funny. You know, you could read it a totally different way and it wouldn't be funny, and it's not always completely funny, but clearly you and Jim Taylor spend an enormous amount of time, I think, making sure that the writing, the dialogue is exactly the way you want it. 
And is that true? I mean, what's that? What's yeah, but not just like? in this scene. Oh, I know in all are, scenes. You know, I just yeah. had a pick. I had a pick one. <laughs> okay, you know, yeah. It's not like this is the yeah. only one. They're all that way. Yeah, we spent a lot of time yeah. writing. And, yeah. and uh, then as a, when I direct, I pretty much <clears throat> like our dialogue recited exactly as written. No, no, no one's kind of riffing on what you wrote. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they shouldn't. I'm troubled by that. I don't entirely buy it when he put his head on her shoulder this time. I used to sort of, but I didn't think it was quite motivated this yeah. time. I didn't quite buy it. I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah. But anyway, we can. We can, we can, we can talk about it. Well, yeah, but I think one of the things that makes these films so interesting is that you can talk about them that way. You can really, you know, they're people, they're real. You can decide, well, would he have acted that way? Would he have not acted that way? You can't do that with, yeah, with some, a lot of something characters. Something could have been better in that scene. Yeah. Something's it, not exactly right in it. It's, is it's this characteristic there. of you? Do you often look at your stuff and feel this way? Oh, yeah. Well, but then you make me watch it. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's part of the deal. It's part of the okay. deal. <laughs> now, tell me how you and Jim, uh, you and Jim Taylor did not meet in an ordinary way. Or maybe you did meet in an ordinary way, but not to meet a writing partner in an ordinary way. We, uh, we for us, the old days is the mid-80s. I, I was at UCLA Film School, and he was working at what was then Canon Films. Wow, I remember Canon. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he had gone to Pomona and went, uh, went to LA to work in the film business. Later, he went to film school in the 90s. But uh, we met through, it turns out we had mutual friends, and we met socially a couple times. And then around 89, um, I needed a roommate, and I put out word through my friends that I needed a roommate, and he showed up. He yeah. needed a place to live. And so our collaboration came from the friendship, which came from, excuse me, our living together. And how do you specifically work? You know, every writing team has a different system. I wonder how you two guys, very specifically, because I think it fascinates people how writing teams, you know, you'd see this, you don't think two people wrote that scene. You mm. know, it, you think, well, one, there's one intelligence there. And clearly, both of you collaborate on it. And I wonder how just, on a technical sense, how yeah, you Yeah, well, he, it's hard because he lives in New York and I live yeah. in Los Angeles. So <laughs> we have to schedule our time together. Um, so, but we always are together in a room at the same time. We don't, sometimes writing teams divide and conquer. Maybe they outline the whole script and well, you take from page one to 60 and you take 60 yeah. to the end and then we'll bring them together or rewrite each other. We don't do that. We're always together in the same room at the same time. And usually sit around and talk about what might happen next and how it might happen because we don't outline or anything. Yeah. And then one or the other of us typically will say, all right, let me have a crack at it and go up and pound out two to five pages and say, okay, I'm ready. Yeah. And then together we rewrite. You rewrite it. Yeah. And we have a system which is one monitor with two keyboards. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. So you don't have to pass the keyboard, because we rewrite together, both there. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we do it like Battleship. <laughs> That's when we used to have two monitors opposing, yeah. so we'd be at opposite ends of the table and both have, be working on the, yeah. and, but now it's one monitor and we, yeah. we're a little more comfortable with each other, so we yeah. sit next to each, each other. other. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, is it, what are the virtues? I mean, this is a system that works for you. Is it, is it, I mean, writing is not easy under any circumstances. Is it easier with another person? I think especially, and uh, I'd be interested in what you have to say about this, but I've merely observed that there's something about screenwriting which lends itself to collaboration. It seems to, I mean. The only other form I can, narrative form I can think of is um, uh, musicals, Broadway musicals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But really only, you, know, you never see plays that are co-written or certainly novels that are co-written, yeah. good ones, and, or poems or anything, but somehow screenwriting and with no detriment to the voice, to a singular voice, yeah. like the, all the great Italian directors and, and Kurosawa yeah, they had would be some, between had a lot of screenwriters. two yeah. and yeah. six writers yeah. on something. Yeah, yeah. You know? Why but somehow we, because we, we make, one, it makes the, uh, what's the solitudinous process, it makes it less hideous, because yeah. it's, it's always hideous. Yeah. And then it's more fun, because we like to hang out together. Yeah. And then about, uh, since we make comedies, it's, well, what makes both of us laugh? laugh. Yeah. And also when you're writing and you think of 20 terrible ideas become, before you come up with that good one, and sometimes you don't even know what that good one is, yeah. so you, the other helps you identify you know, and then, the, then you get into like, oh, yeah, 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 and like, I'll see you and raise you. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, a good idea, yeah. and then what if this? Yeah. Or sometimes I can't think of it, the exact content of what the joke should be, but I know the form of it, and I'll yeah. say, okay, here's the bad version of it, and then 
he'll supply the good version the good back and forth. So yeah, yeah. somehow it works out. Yeah, no, it seems to. It seems to. And it is, you say, you really you sense a single sensibility. You don't feel that. It doesn't, it feels like kind of a melded mind in, in mm -hmm. really the best way. I wanted to talk a little bit about Citizen Ruth. Uh, why did it, I mean, was there something about the project that took it a long time to get, to get made, or is it that the other get fi who, Who's going to finance an abortion comedy? <laughs> <laughs> I guess not very many people. No, <laughs> and it, it barely got made. It's, it, my career got started so, with such hide hideously fine fibers, sinuous, I mean, mm -hmm. my whole destiny hung on you know, finally Harvey Weinstein financed it after he'd said no like four times. Wow. And only because of, of the producer, Kerry Woods, who had other films going on with us, say, please, Harvey, please, please, it's only three million, two and a half million dollars. Yeah. And, you know, and then, oh, all right. <laughs> it, it, my whole destiny hung on an oh, all right, screamed yeah. over his shoulder in the back of a Lincoln <laughs> town car in, in midtown Manhattan. I mean, really. That's the movie business. I mean, I, and I would have had, had to wait who knows how many more years to write something else, and I mean, it's, anyway. Uh, why did you decide that this was a subject that you guys, that was ripe for that, you know, a funny movie? Or ripe for any kind of movie? I've always had the feeling that I don't really choose ideas, but that somehow they choose me. Huh. And Jim and I had, had found the inspiration for Citizen Ruth in an article in the New York Times in early 92, it's a case of a, of a, I mean, there were many cases like that, which we later found, but the initial one we found was an American Indian woman over in Fargo who was recidivist, inhalant abuser, and had eight kids, and, you know, an Indian gal. And um, then the Lambs of Christ got into a tug of war over her, over her and her fetus with, uh, with the gals at the local clinic. And so, and money was offered, and yeah. we just thought, oh, that, that's a comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. It was a comedy. Yeah. It is a comedy. Yeah, it's being made into a musical right now. <laughs> it is. Is that right, really? And they did, they're doing, we saw a, a read-through about two months ago in New York, and we were expecting a train wreck. And they did one, they did a lot of good things. It was a little uneven. Yeah. They're, they're working, it might be good. But they did one thing which brought it up to date nicely, with which is at the end of Act One, uh, they have the pro-lifers saying about the pro-choicers. They're crazy singing. They're crazy. Yeah. They're insane. What's going on with our country? This is terrible. They're crazy. And then it cuts to the pro-choice people singing the same song about the pro-life people. Uh. They're crazy. They're insane. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with our country? And then both sides together come out on, the whole company comes out on stage with Ruth and Middle singing, they're crazy. Uh. They're insane. And I thought, that's good. Because that, uh. that's, that's what's going on. That's what's going on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got, there's a small clip. That's the, the last clip. It's the biggest clip we'll see all night. You mean the longest? The longest. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The rest of them are shorter. And I've, there's a okay. brief clip from Citizen Ruth I wanted to show. So if, if enough time has passed, if we can show it, great. So when can I get the abortion anyway? Thursday would be the soonest. We'll make all the arrangements. Well, does it cost a lot of money? Because I, I don't got any money. Don't worry, Ruth. I'm sure we can find a way to take care of it. How would that be? Whatever. Oh, my God. Come here. You got to see this. Ruth, you don't want to miss this. Oh, look at that moon. She's right down here with us, as if to say everything will be all right. Moon mother, hear us now, feel us now. Earth mother, hear us now, feel us now. Goddess Mother, Mother of us all, hear us.
us now, feel us now. We are one. We are one. Everything's going to be fine. Just fine. You're safe here with us. Yeah. And those lights over there sure are pretty. Mm. Mm. Oh, shit. A vigil. Oh. Come on, let's go. Now well, they've gone inside. Now what? Well, give me a second. I can't see through walls. the second floor. Must be some sort of indoctrination room. Damn it. <laughs> That's funny. That's yeah. a funny one. Yeah. No, I remember quite clearly, you know, again, the first time I saw Citizen Ruth, I didn't know anything about it. It was a film, and I'm enjoying it. And I'm, I'm thinking that it's basically, you know, one of the pushes of it is to make fun of anti-abortion people. And then you get to that scene, and you realize that, no, you're you're out, you know, you're making fun of everybody that's worth making fun of. That's why I really love that scene, because it really, in the context of the film, it's very surprising. And I like, you know, I mean, this idea that everyone is a target, I think, you know, I'd like to hear you talk about that a little bit. Everyone's a target. <laughs> you can do better than that. Even those who represent points of view with which I might agree. Yeah. I like the moment where they, they're so proud that they're going to pay for her abortion. I yeah. think we can, and, she's, and they want the gratitude. Yeah. It's like, whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How good deeds just sort of really secretly want gratitude. I know, I know. It's and the line, I like the light, those lights over there sure are pretty. Yeah. That's a good yeah. line. <laughs> But no, it's funny. I mean, I just like the fact that, you know, that everything is, a t you know, everything that's worth, that you don't allow your personal, whatever personal beliefs you have to stand in the way of something. That's but that is a personal you. belief that everyone's a target. Yeah. That, and that also in this, you know, and a lot of critics wanted a specific political point of view expressed in the film and accused Jim and me as writers and me as a director of being cowardly or copping out. Is that right, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, wow. yeah a lot, a lot. And... And I don't know still what's wrong with the point of view of, you know, this is Terry, Shiv Terry Schiavo, Terry Schiavo, yeah. and Elian Gonzalez, and where you just, it's two dogs fighting over a bone. Yeah. And yes, yeah. you can have and the point of view about it, as I have in all of those cases, but people get more motivated by their own personal agendas often than by what the thing is actually about. Yeah, yeah. Not always, but often. It's, it happens, yeah. I loved, you know, again, seeing it the second time, I loved even more Laura Dern's performance. I mean, the way she throws herself into that, you know, and I just, I mean, how do you... Well, and I liked, and, and, and also with respect to that, I liked the question of, you know, we talk about freedom of choice, but what does choice mean to an animal? And essentially she plays an animal in yeah. that, like un, literally unequipped to choose. Yeah, yeah. And so what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. Not that we answered or anything, but I, for me that question is interesting. That's an interesting question. I mean, how was she hard to cast? Did she get it immediately? She lobbied hard for that part. Really? Oh, yeah. Also, there aren't a lot of great... Well, uh, interesting, I, yeah. <laughs> juicy parts written for women. And one of the reasons that made this somewhat easy to cast with a lot of name people was that it was, that it's the whole cast is basically women. Yeah. And not a lot of parts come along, you know, it's yeah. the whole thing, Hollywood, you know, not good parts for women, yeah. not since the 40s or something. Yeah, yeah. But I like the way, you know, I mean, your characters, you, they embrace extremity. You know, she just, they just really are what they are to a, you know, yeah. they go all the way and that's really, uh, I mean, you're smiling. I mean, that's something you like to see happen on screen. It I like, like extreme things. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say a little more about that? <laughs> you don't have to. I just like seeing somewhat, I mean, yes, uh, we're portraying middle America and, you know, normal people. But for me, fairly, you know, I like emotions fairly vividly. Like, my favorite thing is really to see my films dubbed into Italian. Oh, because, because then it's really, <laughs> the dubbers get really emotional, and I kind of like that. I like yeah. that the film is vivid yeah. in some way. And I think 
<coughs> like that election and sideways were both adaptations, fairly faithful adaptations of books. There's a, a lovely thing for me in adapting a book I like is in a book, there's the moderating voice of the narrator, yeah, you know, of the yeah. narrative, which keeps things within a certain band frequency. Yeah, yeah. But then when you can bring them out and, and have close-ups and have an actor go there and yeah. have montage and music, it's like, it's like taffy, just pull, yeah, it, out pull and, it out as far as and you have can. things stand in relief, yeah, which I like. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you seem like you like a character's extreme, not extreme, not so much, but you know. But one of the things I've written down, characters that a lot of your characters are not easy to like, your protagonists. You don't start off when this film starts, you know, Citizen Ruth is not the person. You say, boy, I'm going to love this person. But by the end of the film, we kind of get on their side to a certain extent, and I'm kind of fascinated by that dynamic. Well, you don't have to like them as people, but you have to like them as movie characters. Yeah, yeah. And I hope have compassion for them as people or as movie characters. I mean, when I hear that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I think, well, what do you feel about, I mean, no one in my films kills anybody. How yeah. do you feel about Alex in yeah. A Clockwork Orange yeah. or Michael Corleone? I mean, I don't really approve of what they do, yeah. but well, then why do you like the movie? And yeah. you love them as characters. Exactly. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, you do, you do. I mean, but I think you're always surprised. And I think maybe it's more here than in the, in the Godfather films because it's, these are so realistic. You know, we don't meet, you know, we're not in the Godfather world, but this could be our world in some sense. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, you know, what it was like. I mean, you had some, you know, you had Tippi Hedren and Burt Reynolds in this <coughs> film, and I wondered what that was. Was that fun for you? Was that a good idea that, I mean, I think they're great in the film. Was it? They're you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that a painful uh, experience? No, I was honored to have them. I'm sorry, what are you asking? Well, I'm just I, curious. I'm, I'm being recorded. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just what was the impetus to use people like that, people who have a real history? Well, it's kind of fun. It's also kind of stunt casting, which yeah. can, can, I mean, I don't do that so much anymore. It was my first film, I was finding my way and trying to get financing, yeah. and every added little bit of star power, you know, helped the money keep flowing yeah, and all that. Yeah. And, and it's cool to work, you know, your first time feature director and working with people with such histories. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Say no more. But stunt casting isn't always the best thing for the film, as yeah. a film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you see where I started with in Citizen Ruth and where I've wound up in in Sideways so far in my yeah, yeah. short it's, it's career, you know, it's, I'm now I'm really only about who's exactly right, right for, for the, the part. part. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. about the context. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Now, I wanted us to talk a little about election, and, you know, one of the, you've kind of preempted one of my questions, the, the idea <coughs> about, about, you know, I wonder if there are any other reasons you like using novels. Three, I think, is it correct? Three of your films have come from novels? Yes, but About Schmidt is a little bit well, it's a, sui yeah, we'll generis get to in terms yeah, of, yeah, yeah, it's basically an original. Yeah. But I mean, what's, besides what you said about pulling everything out, what right. else is appealing about working from novels? It's to, to get a movie idea. Yeah. I mean, you're, I'm just always desperate for yeah. a movie idea. Like, I don't really know what my next feature is right now. I have an idea, but it's going to take some work. And I would love for something to drop into my lap. And I go, oh, this is perfect. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then yeah. the nice thing about a novel is there's a, basically a milieu. There's a, a, an idea, a premise. And then even if Jim and I change a whole bunch of it, at least it's as a reaction to something. And yeah. you know, don't forget 11 of 13. I think of Kubrick's features were adaptations yeah. of novels. It's yeah. nice to yeah. have something to have a discourse with, yeah. and even if, as I say, even if you change a lot of it. Yeah. Are there any pitfalls with novels? Things that you want to make sure you don't do when you're working with a novel? For example, oh, being too faithful to it. Uh, oh, you know, you know, well, if it deserves that. to be yeah. faithful, but the the thing is, the better the novel is, yeah. the more unfaithful you have to be, in a way, because. Um, a good novel succeeds on terms exclusive to literature. Yeah, yeah. And you're turning it into a film, which has to succeed in terms exclusive Very to different film. terms, yeah. So really, often the way Jim and I work is we read a novel two, three, four times, however much we read it, and then never look at it again and write an original based on our memory of the novel. Huh, that's Now, in Sideways, because it, it was very much lived by that writer, Rex Pickett, 
and his sense of dialogue was so unique. Uh, we'd refer to, what did Rex do? What did he say that was so good here? And we'd look yeah. and, and use that. But basically, it's about, it's just what I said. It's writing an original based on our memory of the novel. And we would never get involved with the novel that's so popular that the readers are expecting. Yeah. You know, and then you come up with some, I think, piece of crap I never saw, but like the first Harry Potter film, yeah. which, although wildly popular as a film, I'm sorry, although wildly popular, comma, as a film, yeah, yeah. is like a filmed book on tape, yeah, yeah, because no, of the ex because of the exigencies of the of the writer who has it in his or her contract to be involved, and then yeah. the expectations of the fans and the nervousness of the studio. Yeah, I, I couldn't work like that. Yeah, no, and you're right. Good filmmaking does not come out of a situation like that. Yeah. I mean, sometimes money making filmmaking comes out of it, but not good filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, with election, you, uh, I mean, one of the things that I think you, you like to do is you use non-professional and professional actors. You kind of mix them. And sometimes non-actors. Yeah, non-actors completely. Like the Dairy Queen girl yeah. in About Schmidt. Yeah, yeah. She, she works at that Dairy Queen. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you, how come you enjoy doing that? What's, what's the... Because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> you worry that it might backfire, or? It doesn't. Yeah. Why does Every it Every once in a while, yeah. but it's worth the risk. Yeah. And by the time we get them... Well, I just think if you have a day player, someone who's the, you know just there for one line or two, yeah. and it's a doctor or a Dairy Queen gal or somebody, why bring in an actor to learn what it's like to, to make a, a blizzard? And, <laughs> and how do you do this? And hire someone who works there. Yeah. She'll be fine. She's, you can do it when you hire people who are playing some version of themselves. Yeah. yeah. Have real cops play cops, real doctors play doctors, and you don't need any technical advisors. They're right there. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I, I think in my films, it's nice to have mo huge movie stars with non-actors. Yeah. Because I think it makes both of them, it makes the non-actors look as though they're acting better than they really are. <laughs> and it makes the stars seem realer than they're capable of being. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> do the stars enjoy it? Do the stars feel it's OK? Or do you, you ever ask them, or you just don't? I don't ask. <laughs> Do they ever complain? <laughs> no. Good. The best, the only one where I almost complained was the, the guy, the guy who's screwing Laura Dern at the beginning of Citizen Ruth and later yells at her. Yeah, yeah. He really is that guy. Wow. I mean, not that he really was screwing Laura Dern. <laughs> yeah, but he's, <laughs> but he's, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, but there's a, you know, he didn't have his teeth at the time, and <laughs> we found him in a bar, and he has this intimate scene. So I, <laughs> fearing some trouble, and Laura Dern was like, oh, who's this guy that you cast? <laughs> and I came up to each of them, I shouldn't say that, all right. I came up to each of them before we shot and enlisted. Like I came up to the guy and said, look, Laura's really nervous. You're really going to have to help me out, yeah. make it really easy. And I went up to Laura Dern and said, now look, Lance is really nervous. Yeah. You're really going to have to help me out. And, so it, it worked. Yeah. No, no, it's a great, it's a great scene. And you discovered uh, Chris Klein I did. for election, who has had a career, who's a wonderful actor. Can you talk a little about how that, I mean, did you know immediately that he was going to be good? You know, on some level, not that he would be good, but I, I knew I was interested in him. I was yeah. taking, I, I toured all uh, high schools in Omaha looking for the right high school in which to shoot. Uh. And I was touring, uh, what is it, Millard West High School. And the, the proud principal was showing me around. And Chris Klein walked out of a weight room as we were walking through that wing. Yeah. And he said, oh, look, there's Chris Klein. And let me know, Chris <laughs> just played, he was marvelous in uh, West Side. They just did West Side Story. And he had played Tony in West Side Story. And I just met this guy and thought, wow, this, you know, good looking kid and something about him. And, you know, I was living with those characters. And so yeah. he. he and then I went back to LA and read about 30 or 40 guys. I didn't like any of them. They're just yeah. so pol I didn't believe that they were in high school. Yeah. And then I went back to Omaha and called, I couldn't remember the guy's name, and called up the school office and said, I'm the guy who's <laughs> making that film. And I met a guy, Dr. Kalowski introduced me to him. And, I did, and then she called, couldn't give up my, his number, of yeah. course, called the Klein household. And then Chris Klein called me. And I said, I, you know, I really am a movie guy. And I, <laughs> would you come into the Omaha Film Commission office and audition? And he did. And anyway. Yeah, no, he's wonderful. I mean, he's this. And the yeah. lesbian gal, his sister, I cast off a tape. Really? From St. Louis. Wow. Yeah. Hadn't met her before the first day of shooting. Wow. 
No, but they all they Jessica fit in. Jessica, they fit Campbell. in perfectly. Oh, that's funny. I had read, and this is something I didn't know that the, originally the election had a different ending, and that it had been changed. Right. Can you? Because I really had no. You know, I'm, can you talk about that process? What yeah, happened? we uh, wrote the ending of the film that was in the book, and then as we were testing the film, previewing it, testing it. It just wasn't playing well, and then even I was unhappy with it. I th and basically, I could go into details, but basically the problem is the book is very melancholy and somewhat funny and then allows for this melancholy ending. The movie came out very funny, we think. Yes. Very funny with a little melancholy and then a delivering us to a melancholy ending, and it felt tonally uh, inconsistent. And a lot of what the humor had actually come from the editing. Yeah. Because election is a highly montage-heavy film, and what we, what Kevin Tent and I did, and, yeah. and so um, Jim and I set to work on, with the blessing of the studio, Jim and I went to work on writing something which we might have written had it been an original. Yeah, and came up with that ending, and the studio spent an extra, I don't know, six or seven hundred grand to let us do it, and that's it. So the whole th scene in Washington, that was all your guys' Yeah. Yeah, that's not from right. the book. Yeah, no, it works great. I mean, it's interesting because you'd never, you'd never know that it wasn't a plan that way from the beginning. Yeah, no, that was funny. Now, one of the things, you know, speaking of the studio, I was always, I mean, I think every you know, <coughs> critic in America was frustrated about election because the studio didn't seem to know what to do with it. They didn't seem to know how to sell it. You know, this was a very, you know, was and remains an extremely funny film, and you could just feel that the studio was kind of looking at it and saying, you know, what do I do? I mean, how frustrating is this? I'm assuming it's very frustrating for you, but what do you, you know, can you talk about that a little bit? They never got high school movie and MTV films out of their brain yeah. as far as what it was, when in fact, I never saw it as a high school movie. No. I couldn't have been less interested in making a high school movie. Yeah. I didn't even read the book for about five months because I thought, oh, it's set in a high school. I don't oh, care yeah. about that. Yeah. And MTV Films, which I had nothing to, you know, I don't, MTV, <laughs> you know, just happened to be the producing entity. Yeah. And then at the time, it's different now, but at the time also that was Paramount Studio, who was in those years a very, it's like GM. Yeah, yeah. The, their commercial, it's like, put the star's face on the poster, just like how GM, you know, the new sedan, just show it in the desert, going yeah. like that, and call it a day. <laughs> yeah. And it needed marketing more like what Fox Searchlight just did with Sideways, which yeah. is a little bit more, you know, you're, 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 um, you're marketing the Mini. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not marketing a Chrysler. Yeah. And yeah. so a little bit more care and find the niche audiences that you yeah. want to find. and. Yeah, and maybe allow the director to have some input on the marketing. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that they think they know so much and they really they don't. The two times where they pushed me out of the edit out of the marketing meetings are the two films which have performed the worst. I'm not saying you know post hoc or propter hoc. Yeah. But. Um, I tell marketing departments, you know, I'm paid a lot of money for my ideas. I'm an idea guy. That's yeah. all I do. Yeah. I'm giving you my ideas for free. Take yeah. them or leave them. And yeah. it's really to their benefit to at least, and Fox Searchlight was so good, they actually started driving me crazy in terms of consulting with me. Really? They always were consulting with me too much. Like, it's like, leave me alone. <laughs> you guys figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, now, did they? Uh, did I read? I mean, I that, uh, Fox I Searchlight did Sideways the last. Yeah, one. no, well, they're very. You know, they know what they're doing there. <coughs> but it's, it's must be. Well, I guess you just have to shrug. I mean, finally, you can't be driven crazy, or can you be driven crazy by what happened to election? I mean, does it take you a while to get it well, out of your system? Because I'm not going to fall into that thing of like my film is so good and just the yeah. marketing screwed yeah. it up. I mean, I'll still. I mean, I'm, I'll think, oh, the film must have been bad. Yeah. You no, know, I'm not going to. I just. I think it's too arrogant to say. You know, it's their fault. Yeah, no, yeah. you know, but it was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was their fault. I mean, it was their fault. Yeah. But it's also where I was in my career at the yeah, time. Yeah. And there are a lot of things. You know, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. I, I'm just happy I get them made. Yeah, yeah. I'm just happy I get to be a filmmaker and get them made. Yeah. Which is a no small accomplishment. I'm happy we live in a century when the cinema even exists. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's true. <laughs> Did they try, and I, I've read that in various of your films, like studios try and foist people on you. They try and make you talk to people like Tom Hanks or people like this for some Only reason. on, not anymore. Only, did, I, did it happen on this one or did it not? No. 
uh, election, it happened a lot. Yeah, because election, again, yeah. going back earlier, if there are any film students or, or potential directors in the audience, don't make studio deals. Yeah. Because then they make you go meet or get pat offer it first to all the big actors whom you don't want and who are never in a million yeah. years going to do it. Yeah. Oh, but you never know. You've got to find out. It's like all they care about is the most famous possible people at any given time, regardless of the correctness for the... Yeah, yeah. And it's a big time suck. Yeah. You know, months go by. I mean, cumulatively, that stuff, it's, it's, you know, it takes two, three, four films off your life. Yeah, because they take forever to decide, yeah, and then they say totally. no. Yeah, totally. Are there any people you remember specifically that you had to meet for election? No, because they weren't interested. They weren't interested. But just yeah. all the, oh, you, you know, just, they, yeah. yeah. I could probably think. No. No, it's all right. No, but it's like Tom Cruise, Matthew McConaughey. Tom, Tom Hanks would have been OK. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I the, am good for that part. Yeah. I want that there. I've now got two clips I want to show back to back, though they'll be like a, oh, a 30 or 40 second. They have to change reels. They have to okay. do stuff that, thank God, I, I don't have to do. But uh, it has to do with, uh, with the use of music in your films. Oh, and, good. And there's one clip from, uh, I forget which one is first. Well, one is from uh, about Schmidt, and uh, one is from uh, Election. I don't know which one is up first. Okay. But, uh, I think we can start them now. investment situation work out for you. you. You never called me. Pop quiz, everybody. Aww. Put your stuff away. Come on, no whining. You've done your reading. This should be an easy one. I'd have exactly 48 minutes to make all the arrangements. If you finish early, just sit quietly and check your work. I'll be right back. Okay, everybody, pass them forward. <laughs> I mean, again, seeing the films back to back to prepare for this, I really got more of, I always loved Ralph Kent's work, but I got more of an awareness of how much you use him. And that how that wasn't Ralph Kent. That wasn't, no, was that another no, guy? Because I know there are two people there. That's a knockoff, because yeah, yeah. we couldn't, that's a knockoff of uh, Stan Kenton's Peanut Vendor, ah. which we couldn't, we didn't have the budget for it, so basically you get, there's a guy, Joey Altruda, in L.A. who has a, Does puts like together a, work, a band. Yeah. So you basically take the score and hold it up to the mirror yeah. and transpose <laughs> that and then record that. Oh, yeah. So that's basically that's, Stan Kenton's yeah. Peanut yeah. Vendor. Okay. But talk about music, the, the importance of music, you know, in, in what you do. It's huge. Yeah. There's, there's no 
film, I can't, st you know, we, we were just at the Cannes Film Festival, and I can't tell you how many movies, and because I was on the, a certain regard, one of the selections, I was on the, on the jury, I can't tell you how many of those movies didn't have music in them, basically. Yeah. I thought, it just, it doesn't make you feel good to watch a movie without music, yeah. and, and even in the silent period, I mean, they go to get their... You have to have it. Yeah. it they have a magical relationship, yeah. cinema, you know, image and music do. Yeah, but it's, it seems like, you know, again, we always, the critics always focus on the dialogue and the writing, but I started to think that we should, usually we should pay more attention to the music in your films. Well, there's a degree to which, I mean, as written and dialogue heavy as my films are, there's a degree to which a part of me is making silent films. Yeah. And I'm really just interested in images and telling a story without the use of words, and I hope that even that you could judge my films, even with the dialogue, in the way they used to judge Warner Brothers cartoons, which is, yeah. can you turn the sound down and, and still, still tell, laugh. still utterly follow the story. Oh, the story. Yeah. And I yeah. still try to do that yeah. with my yeah. films, that you could basically watch, but, and not in a way that like, if you don't buy the headphones on the airplane, you can tell. <laughs> be only because you've seen that movie 100 million times before in your life, and it's, but in a good way, that you yeah. can still tell what's going yeah. on. And Rolf Kent, uh, Rolf Kent is almost every one of your films, I think. Yes, all my features. Yeah, all your features. What? I like melody. Yeah. And I don't find too many current composers have a gift for, gift for melody. Huh. And I'm a big fan of uh, Italian composers from the 50s and yeah, 60s. Yeah. You know, Nina Rodin, Morricone, yeah, yeah. and Piero Emiliani, and and <clears throat> and the and the. The French ones, George Delarue and Francis Lai, and I like I like to you know my favorite opera is Carmen. I like things where I can hum melodies yeah, later. Yeah, I yeah. don't like just atmospheric tones and sounds and rhythms. I like melody. Yeah. And Rolf, I found early on, has a gift for melody, and I always yeah. encourage him in that way. And he also has a wit yeah, about yeah, his music, yeah. which I also appreciated in the Italians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that scene. I, I assume that was him in the uh, in the About Schmidt clip. Oh yeah. yeah, and that's. Uh, Sideways is a fairly fairly showy jazz yeah. score, and it's up front. But I, I think in its own way, uh, I recommend the About Schmidt score yeah. in the yeah. as a CD. Yeah. It's it's surprisingly good, I yeah. think. Do you have to give him a lot of? I mean, like with the, like that scene. That, you know, do you say anything to him, or you just show him the scene and say just do something, or show him the movie? I have some ideas. We had uh, early on. Notice when we cut to Kathy Bates and she's eating the pork chop yeah, and sucking yeah. her fingers, suddenly you hear the erhu, which is the, the um, Chinese upright violin ah. like that. We had conceived of, of Denver as China somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's just how what you get into, yeah. however arcane it is, yeah. and that she is the dowager queen. <laughs> so in the film, basically, whenever you see her, you hear erhu. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I just, again, this is an obvious thing, but I mean, you, m directors, when they can, like to use as much of the same team as possible on their films. And I wonder, some do. I don't yeah. think all, some like to, you know. Some people. But I know Clint Eastwood. I know Clint Eastwood does does the same people. What are the virtues of working? I mean, I think it's kind of obvious, but I'm curious if you can just shorthand. Yeah. And being able to refer, like I can talk to Jane Stewart, my production designer, who, whom I go back with, not just to Citizen Ruth, but even to films we made for the Playboy. I go back the farthest with Jim Taylor, Jane Stewart, and Rolf, yeah. because I met, we did a uh, series for the Playboy Channel in 1991 together, and wow. Rolf and Jane were the staff, composer, and production designer, respectively, and I met them there, and I just was knocked out by them and yeah. um, have worked with them for going on 15 years. Wow. But it's, it's so nice to be able to say to Jane, oh yeah, remember that thing with, you just, we don't have to break each other into anything yeah. with sensibility, yeah. I know. And the whole great thing about, and you're actually you're asking about collaboration, which yeah. is, has become for me the most enjoyable and best part of filmmaking, is collaborating really? yeah, with my great. department heads. Yeah. And it's all due to the quality of questions that you ask each other. Huh. It's about, elicit I'm not like Zeus of the film as Athena that springs yeah. fully formed from my brain. It just isn't yeah. like that at all. Yeah. It's you elicit the film from one another, you and your creative department heads. Yeah. And it's, again, about the quality of questions you ask each other. Yeah. 
What I wanted to talk a little bit about about Schmidt, just because I mean, you mentioned your original. I think it was called The Coward. The the script you did. Can you talk about how the book and The Coward came to come together to become the film? When I was in film school, I was imagining that my first feature film would take place in Omaha and would be about this. He was actually a Greek, about this Greek guy from Omaha who's uh, retires from a, a reinsurance company and realizes how much he's... And I was somewhat influenced by Ikiru, Kurosawa's Ikiru, yeah, and yeah. Wild Strawberries, and even The Graduate, in terms of someone who <clears throat> reaches a, a mile, what do you say, mile post? Milestone. Milestone uh, event, in like graduation yeah. or retirement, and rather than feeling accomplishment, yeah, yeah, feels. feels nothing but alienation yeah. and loneliness. And uh, I always like that about The Graduate. And so, and then putting that in Omaha, and so the, basically the first half of About Schmidt is what I wrote alone about 10 years ago. Huh. And then the second half of it had, I hadn't really figured out. And then when we were commissioned to adapt About Schmidt, we started to do it and we found ourselves, you know, it's a very good book, but what was connecting me to that the theme of retirement was really what I had already written, and Jim yeah. agreed. Yeah. So we solved narrative problems together, which I had not alone solved huh. 10 years previously, using some narrative threads from the book. From the book. To wit, that he has a daughter who's about to be married, who has an overbearing um, future stepmother, yeah. that she's going to marry a boob. Yeah. Um, that the wife dies, that he's widowed during the yeah. course of the film. So just even those, just those elements are enough to make a movie out yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's great that they come together that way. I want to ask you, you know, we've seen him a lot, I mean, on this, not only here tonight, but on the screen, you know, working with, a, with an actor like Jack Nicholson, <clears throat> I mean, you have both an extremely gifted actor and an actor with a large reputation. You know, I mean, is it at all daunting to work with someone like that, or can you not even allow yourself to think that way? You just have to think of him as just another person. I mean, by the time we were shooting, I'd already known him for yeah. 10 months. Wow. I think, and, and uh, it was daunting the very first time I went to go yeah. meet him. Oh, here's, you know, and then. Yeah, you're, they're just, just another, he's, he's finally an actor. Yeah. yeah, as Jane, my production designer. <laughs> would say, she go, you know, just remember, he might be filet, but he's still a piece of meat. <laughs> 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 and he made it easy for me, ma'am, and he is aware, as aware, more aware than you are that he's Jack Nicholson, yeah, and yeah, he yeah. makes, you know, he, he makes efforts to be, dis, to disarm you and yeah, be cool and yeah. professional, and he was great to, I mean, my experience is the better they are, the bigger they are, the easier they are, because they can do it. Yeah. Yeah. The hardest things is when you have someone who freezes or can't remember his dialogue and you yeah. tear your hair out. Yeah. Did, what, did anything surprise you about working with him that you hadn't expected? Well, extending from what I just said, yeah. how easy it was. Yeah. I remember the first week, I was a little daunted. The, I mean, we were always very respectful of him. And I was always obviously very respectful. Just even had he not been, I mean, but he's an older gentleman working with me on my film and, yeah. you know, and he's great at it. Uh, but we didn't have a huge budget with which to make the film. I mean, his salary was about half of the budget. Yeah. The rest was basically the same realm as uh, Sideways, about the same budget of film. Yeah. And so, which means I can't really allow too much experimenting on the set. I have to make all my days, and I have to kind of pre-imagine and uh, impose the blocking yeah. to a certain degree. I mean, I'm pretty loose with that. Uh, but I remember the first couple days telling Jack Nicholson, okay, Mr. Nicholson, you're going to come in and yeah. walk to here, and then I'm going to cut, then we'll make a close-up, and then we'll reset the camera over here, and you walk over here, and, you know, laying out the scene. And I said, you know, is that okay? <laughs> and he said, look, anything you come up with, I can find a way to justify it to myself. So, <laughs> so what do you need? <laughs> well, the exact opposite of what you hear about in the movies, yeah. like, my character would never do that, that. and yeah. what's my motivation? Yeah. Yeah. None of that at all, ever. Yeah. It was almost like, yeah, anything you come up with, I can, you know. I can manage, I can handle it. Yeah, I, I'll handle. find a way to make yeah. it work. Oh, He's a total yeah. pro, and don't yeah. forget, he comes from 
We well, started with Roger Corman. He did, and he refers to those days. You've interviewed him a couple times, right? Yeah, yeah. Early, years and years ago, yeah. and then more recently, yeah. as I recall, yeah. right? Yeah. And he uh, worked for a million years with Roger Corman, making those. So he understands all of that and refers to those years more consistently than he does to his more famous films really? since. In my experience. Wow, that's interesting. Maybe he's just yeah. making me feel good. But. Yeah. No, no, no. I think you know, I think they were exciting times for him, probably. Yeah. yeah. What the, one of the things that I, I really love about, about Schmidt, and again, I've seen all the films I noticed you use a lot is something, and, and use really brilliantly, something that sometimes people frown on, which is a lot of voiceover. Oh, I love voiceover. Yeah. Talk problems. about why you like voiceover. Well, I think along with music, it's one of the greatest contributions mm -hmm. of talking cinema. Because huh. you can finally, because the novel still has it all over the movies in so many ways. You can, I mean, there's nothing... I mean, I love a great movie, but in a, in a way, there's nothing better than a great novel yeah. in terms of really capturing complex fabric of life and thoughts and just the richness of character. And so, um, you know, and a novel can go this way and that, and a movie, a narrative movie, is fairly analog. It has to proceed in a certain way, and anything that goes too far this way or that is tends to fall off the edges and yeah. you tend to simplify character. and That's frustrating to me because yeah. I want to get real people. Yeah. So it's nice to be able to have voiceover as an added element. And it's been much aligned because of how it's badly used, yet when well used, it's extraordinary, like yeah. in Kubrick films and yeah. uh, Wilder films and yeah. Malick films. I, and, I think, you know, this deer and Dugu, I mean, yeah. that, I think that stuff is wonderful. Well, and yeah. also since you make comedies, since we make comedies, our, the use of voiceover is largely often ironic. Yeah. Unreliable yeah. narrators, the old unreliable yeah. narrator. Yeah, yeah. No, I enjoy those. I also, there's something, and you mentioned a little bit, but I've got some, a couple of clips now I want to show about physical comedy. Again, wordless oh, scenes, uh, scenes of physical comedy. Oh, good. So, uh, I was at the end of my count when it happened. I'd come up with exactly the same numbers as Larry, 256 to 257. Tracy had won the election by a single vote. I was about to announce my tally when... The sight of Tracy at that moment affected me in a way I can't fully explain. Part of it was that she was spying, but mostly it was her face. 
watched it again. I, it, was, it was great for me to, to, you know, to recognize again that even though you, everyone thinks of your films as very verbal, that there's this physical comedy element that's very It's prominent. really all I'm interested in. Really? <laughs> the first one is, is basically that's like 1 a.m., Chaplin's 1 a.m. when yeah, he comes home yeah. drunk and he wrestles yeah, with, yeah. with the bed. Or, and you know, we purposely under, uh, you, you don't put, you put less water in it so it flops, flops around more. like that. Yeah, yeah. Was that easy to shoot? I mean, was it a one take thing or was it very uh, elaborate? Three takes. Three takes. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's good at that stuff. He's yeah. good at comedy. Yeah, I mean, it's just wonderful to see that, you know. And again, mm -hmm. I always love the way Reese Witherspoon, the way she. He, and also, I have to say, also like Chaplin, because yeah. I, you learn from Chaplin and from Fred Astaire movies to show comedy full frame. Yes, yes. Not cut up. Yeah. Lloyd is much more montage based. Yeah. But Chaplin and Fred Astaire are much more about. Yeah, you see the feet. Yes. Yeah. And so there's no cutting yeah. in in that in the waterbed thing. I yeah. wanted it all just only performance. Yeah, yeah. And what, I'm sorry, what were you going to oh, say no, about Oh, no, the Reese Witherspoon, I mean, even her walk is really funny. I mean, the physical yeah. aspects of her character. I like really... when she turns the corner with yeah. a little <laughs> flourish. <laughs> I mean, do actors get this? I mean, you know, this kind of way that you like, to, you know, is it? Well, it's in the, it's, a lot of it's in the script. Yeah. I mean, her, the verb in the script is she pogo sticks up ah, and down. OK. Yeah. And it's, it's really, it was pre-imagined that she would do that. Yeah. Yeah. And in, you talk about voiceover, when she's jumping up and down, there is a piece of voiceover written and recorded for that spot. But I so liked just watching her that I got yeah. rid of it. Yeah. Okay. I, wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about Sideways to finally come to Sideways. Uh, I wonder, you know, I mean, the, the, again, I mean, I have, it's the only one of the, the books of yours that are based on the novel that I read the novel. And I, I, you saw a lot more of potential in that novel than I would have seen. And this is not a novel, this novel, you know, that as we know had trouble getting published. What did you guys see in it? How did you see, you know, or is that very hard to put your, your fingers on? <clears throat> I guess we just saw a movie in it that, yeah. that you might not have seen. Yeah. And I'm happy about that, by the way, because it's, you know, there's competition for the good novels sometimes. <laughs> and I'm happy that I got something that no one saw. And I, I have to say the same thing about Election. Yeah. Election, when it reached Jim and me, was uh, similarly unpublished huh. and had made the rounds with filmmakers and no one bit. Yeah. Um, Can you put your finger on what you see in these things, aside from the opportunity to make an interesting That it film? corresponds to real life and is relatively free of contrivance, other than the contrivance of the idea of the piece, you know, yeah. four characters telling their points of view around a weird high school election, yeah. or two old friends go on a, a road trip through wine country the week before one of them is to be. It's a premise. Yeah. I want to distinguish yeah. premise from contrivance. Yeah. Yeah. And that they remain that they're really real and uh, and contain sadness and humor. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. But they're, they're somewhat lifelike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had a, a pretty, a fairly leisurely, you know, for an independent film, a fairly leisurely shoot. It was like 50 days or something? Yeah, but all my films are about 50. Yeah. The last three. Yeah. Well, even Citizen Ruth was, I think, 42 days. Yeah. And then the last three have all been about 50 days. Yeah. Is it, I mean, what are the benefits of not having to go crazy? I mean, not having to. Uh, you still have to go crazy. You go crazy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's still short. Yeah. But yeah. it's about right. It's about yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you get, you know what though? In having, you need to have time to play with the actors. Ah. And the actors don't, shouldn't have to feel rushed. You just, it's so nice to have time. You know, you need, you need time. You need time to write. You need time to edit. Yeah. And you need time to work so, yeah. so that everything isn't just lighting. And then you hurriedly cram the performances and just have them say the words in the right order. Yeah. And, yeah. and especially since my films are so performance based, it's, it really is the writing and the performance. The yeah. camera could be a little bit this way or that way. It wouldn't make that much difference. But yeah. it's writing and performance because yeah. it's all about the tone. Yeah. Yeah. The actors yeah. have to be the appropriate vessels for the tone yeah. that Jim yeah. and I have yeah. conceived. You know. Yeah. It was, it was sideways, was it hard to cast? No, it was pretty, sideways, the whole thing was pretty easy. Really? Yeah, surprisingly so. It became so easy and calamity free that I even stopped fearing saying so out of fear of jinxing it. <laughs> you know, the, the whole thing, cast and getting it financed, surprisingly was easy. It was the first time in my career where I could get financing without having to have a star, you know? 
Is that all for the success of the uh, of the previous yes, three? Yeah. And and God bless Fox Searchlight, the studio. Yeah, yeah. You know that they gambled on me and won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it really uh, they didn't. Nobody tried to make you change the cast or anything. Other studios did. Really. And and we didn't go with them. Yeah. Who did they want? Uh, and good actors. I don't want to say these are stupid choices. Yeah. They're good. Like uh, one studio wanted um, Will Ferrell to play Miles, and I love Will Ferrell. Yeah, he's he's great, guy, but yeah. he's not the you know he's, he's not, not Paul Giamatti yeah. for that part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Fox let you go with him. Yeah. Didn't say boo. Yeah. Didn't say anything. Why don't we get? I mean, I think this is kind of. I mean. These kind of character movies are so wonderful. I mean, I think that's why, you know, for critics to see something like this. I mean, are other people, do you feel alone out there sometimes making these kind of movies? Like, are these the ones that are so involved with character that try and be real, that try and really have that kind of tang of, of reality? Or, I'm sorry. Do you feel alone among like, uh, directors? I mean, it's not like there's a lot of films. Well, you have to say American films. American films. Because European yes, films are still, are still doing it. Yeah, yeah. very, very yeah. much so. Um, well, no, there's some younger directors who yeah. are trying to do it, you know, David Russell, you know, that, yeah. the, the yeah. gang that I get lumped in with, yeah. I mean, <laughs> whether I like this film more or less than the other film, yeah. still, we're all directors, I think, I mean, I'm 44, so there's a bunch of us between, say, 35 and 45, basically, yeah. who, like me, we're all, we're weaned on 70s films, yeah. and, and the idea of, of personal cinema, yeah. as opposed yeah. to corporate cinema. Yeah. I couldn't decide. There was, a, I mean, I ended up with kind of, for a variety of reasons, uh, one scene from Sideways. But one that I thought of including that I didn't is actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie, <clears throat> which is when he steals. It's a scene that most people hate. It's when he steals money from his mother. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I really love that scene because for me it says, you know, this is this is not a great guy. Mm -hmm. You know, don't make any mistakes. Don't think this is like a movie where he's really a great guy. He's not a great guy. He could still be a great guy and still steal still money from his mother. I mean, I don't know. It's, yeah. He's not killing anybody. That's true. You see, That's most other movies are killing people. Yeah. Oh, it's, I like Schwarzenegger in that film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but have you taken grief about that money stealing scene? You sound yeah, like you're taking grief. I don't get it. He, all he's yeah. doing is stealing a few bills from his mother. What's yeah. the big deal? <laughs> We all, what do we, what do, each of us does things that are reprehensible in some way at some point or other in our lives. I mean, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the what is it? The moat in your in the other in your neighbor's eye when you have a beam in your own. I mean, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, no, we all do it. We all do it. No, the one I ended up with, which I think I want to show now, is the uh, you know the, the the scene where the two of them where they talk about wine. You know, which uh, oh, okay. yeah. you know, which is I just love that scene. You know, I wanted it's one of the things I thought about before I played this. Well, let me play. The, let's play the scene first, and then I'll okay. tell you one reason why I thought of including it. So, you know, can I ask you a personal question, Miles? Sure. Why are you so into Pino? <laughs> I mean, it's like a thing with you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's a hard grape to grow, as you know, right? It's, uh, it's thin skin, temperamental, ripens early. It's, you know, it's not a survivor like Cabernet, which can just grow anywhere and, uh, thrive even when it's neglected. No, nah, Pinot needs constant care and attention. You know, and in fact, it can only grow in these really specific little tucked away corners of the world. And, and only the most patient and nurturing of growers can do it, really. Only somebody who really takes the time to understand Pino's potential can then coax it into its fullest expression. And then, I mean, oh, its flavors, they're just the most haunting and brilliant and thrilling and subtle and ancient on the planet. Now, I mean, you know, Cabernets can be powerful and exalting, too, but they seem prosaic to me for some reason, you know, by comparison. I don't know. I don't know. What about you? 
Doesn't want to pop me. I don't know. Why are you in a wine? Oh, I think I... I originally got into wine through my ex-husband. Uh -huh. You know, he had this big... sort of show-off cellar, you know? Right. But then I discovered that I had a really sharp palate. Mm -hmm. And the more I drank, the more I liked what it made me think about. Like what? Like what a fraud he was. <laughs> no, I mean, I like to think about the life of wine. Yeah. How it's a living thing. I like to think about what was going on the year the grapes were growing. How the sun was shining, if it rained. I like to think about all the people who tended and picked the grapes. And if it's an old wine, how many of them must be dead by now? I like how wine continues to evolve. Like if I opened a bottle of wine today, it would taste different than if I'd opened it on any other day. Because a bottle of wine is actually alive. And it's constantly evolving and gaining complexity. That is until it peaks. Like you're 61. And then it begins its steady, inevitable decline. Mm. And it tastes so fucking good. So one of the reasons, I mean, aside from the fact that I really love that scene, I mean, there's a, one of my favorite film books is Aaliyah Kazan's autobiography. And he talks in it about, I mean, one of the most played scenes over and over again is the, uh, I, you know, I want, you know, I could have been a contender scene from On the Waterfront. And Kazan says in his book, you know, whenever I'm watching TV and the scene comes on, I say, oh, I hate that scene. I've seen that scene so often. I, I can't believe they're showing it again. And he watches the scene, and when it ends, he says, you know, actually, it's a really good scene. You know, do you have those kind of feelings? I mean, this is probably the most kind of clipped scene from that movie, maybe. And uh, but I still think it's a wonderful. I mean, do, do you get it's a little it? it's a little talky for my taste. Is that right? Really? <laughs> no. I like the scene before it. I like Which the scene the before it. In when they're talking about his novel and they're on the sofa and yeah. the, I, that's a more fun scene for. Yeah. This is okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, people like, I, I, again, you never know exactly yeah. what people are going to like. and um, So this never seemed to you when you were making like it was going to be a key scene? Well, we spent a lot of time writing those speeches. I didn't, you never know what's going to be a know. key scene. No, and, and I'm glad I didn't direct it thinking it's going to be a key scene, because sometimes when you're too precious directing something like, all right, everyone quiet, we're filming the end of the movie yeah. now. It, it, it doesn't it work. It doesn't yeah, work. You, you have to keep yeah. everything yeah. fairly work-a-day. Yeah. No, but they are so good in that. I mean, again, I think the casting was really, were you really confident that you had, I mean, it's a, it's a spectacular cast. Did you feel that Thank going you. in? Thank you. I was confident with that cast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I won't claim to having many talents within filmmaking, but I think I'm good at casting. Yeah, yeah, and it's really important. Yeah. And that's most, you know, the old cliche, 90% of directing is casting. Yeah. You just yeah. cast right, and then you don't have to work as hard. Yeah. They, you know, they do it. No, it helps. It helps. What is, uh, do you, I mean, one of the things I read that I, I want to know if, there's, if it's ever going to happen, that you were interested in doing a Western. Oh, yeah, I, like to, I love Western. Yeah. We were talking about Anthony Mann backstage, yeah, my yeah. favorite Western director. Is that something, is that still in the back of your mind? It is, it is, but the story's got to be right. Because yeah. they're basically in, let's see, the 80s, you know, in the last 20 year, 25 years, we really have only had one good Western, which is Unforgiven. Yeah. So it's yeah. a bit, moribund if not yeah. dead. So it really needs to be, I think you have to return out of primary sources and, huh. and consider it. And also two things, one is you have to return to primary sources and, make a, and not make a Xerox of all the other Westerns because yeah. no one wants to see that. Yeah. And the other thing is in what way can it uh, be pertinent to our times? <clears throat> so I think you have to approach a Western nowadays like Little Big Man or McCabe and Mrs. Miller, like what would they be now, Equipment which are now. completely yeah. about our times, yeah. Yeah. and with a real sense, like McCabe and Mrs. Miller, with a genuine ring of authenticity. Yeah. 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 What, uh, 
you know, one of the things, one of the, again, some of the clips I thought of showing that we just, there was a limit to how much time I was allotted for clips. I mean, again, this is a quote possibly <clears throat> spurious from you. Uh, I think films have to have a little danger. You know, I think oh, that, yeah. there are things in your films where you really kind of, uh, you use, you know, raunchy language. There's that great full frontal male nudity scene in Sideways. You seem to like to like make audiences like sit up a little bit. And you achieve that, I think, only by through restraint. Huh. <clears throat> like I, my problem with Farrelly Brothers films is that's all it is, and yeah. so it loses meaning. Yeah. But if you have a long time of the film which doesn't have, so election starts off, you know, half twenty minutes in with the line about having sex with Tracy, yeah. Yeah. and Citizen Ruth climaxes, if you will, yeah. with that line about well. Uh, if you, the mother says, what if I had aborted you? Yeah, and she yeah. responds with a very sordid line, which yeah, is, yeah. And, uh, and then the guys, uh, Johnson and Sideways. And sideways, yeah, which really but I think, comes out of nowhere. But then it has impact. Yeah, yeah. Impact comes through restraint. Things have to be in relief. Yeah. yeah. Is it gotten, I mean, you, you kind of indicated it has, I mean, the success of Sideways, is it going to make you making your kinds of films easier, do you think? Or may, maybe not. I mean, is it just there other always, kind of stuff that's getting thrown at you that doesn't interest you? Yeah, I mean, I still remain very interdirected, and I mean, I, <clears throat> I can't force myself to like something I no. don't like. Yeah. And, and where I want to go now is, I actually want to catch my breath a little bit, and the the whole sideways tsunami in a way, yeah. and the success of it was, as I said earlier, has is, is been something I've had to deal with and adjust the way I live a little bit. And, and uh, I don't want it to interfere with my filmmaking and what I want to make next. Yeah. But the great thing about the success yeah. of Sideways is it'll give me the opportunity to make things or thing yeah. which otherwise would be very difficult to get made. And, and I'm thinking both in terms of content and form. Because yeah. I think increasingly about film form and film language. Huh. And we certainly, and, and as much as you can talk about what the content of American films needs, you also have to, you know, content is form. I mean, or form is content. So you have to talk about film language. And uh, I mean, the thing about 70s film yeah. is there was a constant influx of new film language. Yeah. And that we yeah. really need that now. And, and how. <clears throat> screenwriting books and corporate filmmaking, which seeks to have movies as, I'm quoting myself, but as, yeah. as readily consumed as McDonald's hamburgers, yeah. seeks only uniformity yeah, they want cookie and cutter movies. death. Yeah. It's, it's death in terms of form. So I, I really want to, you know, who knows what I'll come up with, but yeah. this is at least what I'm aspiring yeah. to tonight. Okay. Well, I think that's to end my part of the presentation. I think that's a good spot. Yeah. We will take a Questions from the audience now. Can we bring the lights up? Yeah, well, hopefully we'll change the lights. And one of the things I very much enjoy about your movies is a very vivid sense of place. And I'm wondering what you think are the primary elements that add up to that sense of place. Um, observation of place, feeling it, spending time there and shooting it unchanged. Or the way you change the place is to make it appear in film even more as it really is than if you just shot it. Like having to put lights in or something so you see it. I was just wondering if you think <coughs> the future movies will be diminished at all because the new generation directors won't have grown up with Super 8 cameras like you did, but with video cameras. I have no idea. You could say that, they're, that it's a big advantage now to having super, uh, video cameras because you can make, I mean, I always wanted to have sound. And also, you don't have to develop it. The, the, the expense isn't as great. So the, I think filmmaking knowledge is much more accessible and democratic than it ever was, which also leads to other problems, which is too much bad stuff floating around. You know, they talk about that with editing that uh, because you have the avid and you can try everything really fast, you, your word indulge, which has a certain negative connotation, but you experiment, you try, you can go through a lot of different options. Whereas when you were cutting and pasting film, you'd think a little bit more about what the cut's going to be before doing it. 
And you think of the miraculous films edited before the Abbey. You think of, I yeah. mean, how did they do the Wild Bunch? Yeah. How how can you cut the Wild Bunch in under like five years? Yeah. Without the Abbot, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, it's true. Well, people become feeling it's the only way to do it. Yeah, yeah. But it was just it was very painstaking. Yeah. Hi. Um. I really loved Sideways, and the but I found that a lot of women that I've talked to had a lot of problems with the male characters, the two main characters. I mean, <coughs> they, the, you know, even personally talking with them, but also overhearing conversations about Sideways. Oh yeah, but I, I don't know, those guys were- What so, was their problem? Uh, they just thought that they, they were, they, they didn't like their attitude about women, I guess. Uh, you know, the... <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to know, uh, what you what your response is to that? And My response is: Are they? Do you disbelieve them? If they're not believable, then okay, then I have to look at it. But if you believe them, then, but you're judging them harshly, or offend, or just judging them, or offended by them, then I can't help. You know, that's who they are, and they're not necessarily my mouthpiece. <laughs> It's not autobi, you know. <laughs> Sam Peckinpah has movies of rape scenes and the woman likes it, you know, it's, it's degrees. <laughs> when I see your films, I uh, have a resonance with some of Hal Ashby's films. No. If you had, uh, what's your feelings about Ashby? I adore Hal Ashby films, and I think he's, his string of films in this, I haven't actually, and I've never seen his 80s films. Did you ever meet him? Never met him, no, I, I understand you look a he was bit, And you look a little, a bit, little like bit like him. A little bit like him, yeah. yeah. I understand he was, he was quite a character from what I understand. Yeah. yeah, but his string of films in the 80s, briefly, The Landlord, Harold and Maud, The Last Detail, uh, Shampoo, um, Coming Home, Being There, I'm missing one. Uh, Bound for Glory. Bound for Glory, yeah. Seven films in nine years is unbelievable. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And by the way, The Landlord. Have you seen The Landlord? Yeah, yeah The Landlord's a I wild film. I love that film. Yeah, yeah. And beautiful Gordon Willis photography. Yeah, and it's yeah. very beautiful. Yeah, I love Hal Ashby. And uh, I kind of, Sideways is somewhat, Sideways for me is influenced in a way both by Italian comedy of the late 50s and early 60s and kind of by Hal Ashby in a way, and, and even the, that Sideways has split screens in it yeah, yeah. comes from the Thomas Crown Affair, which he edited. Oh, really? Huh. Which he huh. edited. Thank you for that. <laughs> you are maybe okay. Um, you had mentioned that you received your undergraduate degree in uh, literature. I'm just wondering in if history, there are any, yeah. um, formative pieces of literature that still have an influence on when you're writing your scripts for your new movies? I don't know. I don't know. I think a lot, I, I often think of, of, again about reality, I often think of something that Garcia Marquez says, which is that creation is memory. And how much of his creation comes from just stuff he remembers from his life. And, and that's been something I think about from time to time. But no, that's a good question. I actually, I, not, I'd have to think about that for a while. That's a good question. Thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate your being here today. This is a great honor for us. Um, Thanks a lot. I'm interested in your psychology. Huh. What's going to happen to you and your spirit and your soul and as you get more and more successful? And how will that you know, reflect in your films? What, any thoughts on that? <laughs> I think it's fascinating. <laughs> One more question. No. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I try to look at success as a commodity to try to get more films made as much as possible. Again, as I said, with Side Sideways started, here's the screwy part about it. My experience has been 90% of success is more people trying to use you to make their dreams come true. And that could be from below, like people out of the blue coming out of nowhere saying, can you read my script? Like, I can't even read, I can barely get to the gym. You know, what do you mean I'm gonna read your script? I don't know you. I'll, what do you think? And Jim and I, we never hit up anybody ever for anything. Yeah. And it's like, that's not how, that's, you know, it's sort of not cool. Yeah. 
or from above, like, will you sit on this charity board? Like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Am I a, an asshole if I say no? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You know. And then the other part of it, the ten percent's fun, and I have interesting access to people these days, and and the op But most importantly, the only thing I think a filmmaker really thinks about is getting the next film made, and how can I use this to get a film made. So that part has been cool. I remember when Jim and I got our first Oscar nomination for election, my dad called up that morning from Omaha. And he said, now don't let this go to your head. <laughs> and I said, no, dad, but I want it to go to other people's heads. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. I mean, yeah, one hopes not. Sometimes I've experienced that uh, the perception of others changes more than I feel I have changed. Yeah. Yeah. Both in terms of like job givers and friends who don't know me very well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like it's not real. Oh, you've changed. Well, really, is it me? Yeah. yeah. You know, I didn't return your calls even before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like you even then. <laughs> so, but it's a good question, you know, and it's a good thing to be to to be thinking about. I, I admire Almodovar. Who's, uh, who's, who gets, has huge, I mean, he can't walk anywhere in Madrid. That yeah. guy, without, he's like, he's, he's the Fellini of our generation, yeah, you know. Yeah. He's, he can't go anywhere without people clawing at him. And uh, he still gets his work done. I think really the answer is just keep your eye on the ball and keep getting your work done. I think so. You know? I think so. Hey, thanks for being a good audience. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for being a good host. Yeah.